That was Elizabeth's greeting from Wagner's Tannhäuser. And it isn't perhaps the kind of music one instinctively thinks of in connection with Montserrat Caballet, because this Spanish singer is more closely identified increasingly and throughout the world with the art of bel canto, the singing of those roles, mainly Italian, the heroines of Donizetti and Bellini and Rossini and Verdi, the art in which the beauty of tone, the beauty of the voice is dominant. And I think that in the 70s, Montserrat Caballier is likely for opera girls throughout the world to ascend the throne vacated by Maria Callas, who occupied it in the 50s and the 60s, the throne of the undisputed queen of bel canto singing. And she's going to be talking about that art and what she thinks of it and of her roles in her career this evening. Let's begin at the beginning, Madame Caballier. Your family was a musical family, I think. Yes, uh, I mean, it uh, was not uh, special musical in that kind of uh, working in that, but uh, my father was a big fan of great singers and my mother did it. And they go always to the, our Liceo, that is our opera house mm -hmm. in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, uh, all the time I remember my first opera was Madame Butterfly. I think I was four or five years old, was afternoon performance. Never forget. I never forget the impression they gave me. There was a Spanish singer, this guy. That was Mercedes Capsir. He plays very beautifully and he sings very beautifully. For me, it was a terrible impression to see that woman kill himself <laughs> on stage. But anyway, Mama explained me that's not the truth. Uh, when did you think? When? How old were you when your parents first began to think, and when you first began to think? that you might have a musical life in front of you? Oh, well, that was late. Uh, I was 14. <laughs> uh, after eight years in conservatory, uh, I studied piano and music. And then the professor of, of uh, music says, I have a voice. And my Elton was very surprising. But Papa says, that's not new. Myself, I have a voice. Mm -hmm. So I said, <laughs> that's uh, normal. And then I was just made a, a proof. And I was accepted. And I have begun to study vocal. And I was made a career, um, official career, in the conservatorium. I finished with 23 years. So I have uh, many years of music before I began to sing. Oh, yes. This, well, this was in the conservatory in Barcelona? Yes, always. I, I studied only in Barcelona. Ah. And when did you first sing professionally? What was your first engagement and where was it? My first opera was La Serva Padrona of Pergolesi. And I remember, I do it with Maestro Novazzi. And I remember that uh, in the performance I was very afraid, you see. And all the time I can, I turn my back to the people. Well, I was thinking that covers me for all my shame and <laughs> everything. <laughs> and after the performance, I was thinking, oh, I have sung. Now it's good. Now will come the maestro and say, it's good, etc." And he came so mad to me, and he says, all the time we you beg. I see only your beg. I listen nothing to your voice. Well, what anyway was an experience, my <laughs> state. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was my beginning. That was in Spain. And immediately, I was to Italy for my uh, auditions. The first one was in Neapel. And I arrived very, very sure of myself, you know, very sure. I sang Sonambula and uh, In Quelle Trine Morbide of Manolo Esco. And Di Costanzo is a friend of mine today. He laughs always when he remembers. <laughs> uh, he listened to me and he says, well, 
you have a little nice voice. I know, Sven, you have more voice to sing in your home. But anyway, <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> oh, for me, it was a shocking. <laughs> then my second audition was in Rome for a very important agent in Italy. He listened to me and he says, my dear child, I think it's better you go again home and you marry, you see. I think you are a wonderful thing to be a good mother. <laughs> so can you imagine? I was so depressed after that two auditions. Then I was to Florence to make my last audition. When I was thinking, three is enough. But the three, I try again. <laughs> I try. And that was for Maestro Siciliani, that was today is the chief of La Rai in Italy. And Siciliani listened to me, and he liked the voice. And he engaged me to sing a Spanish opera, La Vida Breve. Yeah. And I was very happy. And so that was my beginning. I was 24. And then for one year, I sang nothing. Well, it was not contracts. And then Siciliani sent me to uh, Basel in Switzerland. It uh, was a nice theater. I was learned very much in Basel. I think you first sang in England at Glyndebourne when you sang the Marshallin in Rosencavalier and the Countess in Figaro. Now, Glyndebourne, as you may know, has a reputation over the years for finding great singers at the beginning of their career. How did your Glyndebourne engagements come about? <laughs> Well, it was a, a very pleasant experience. But in the moment when I came to Glyndebourne, was the, let's say, the beginning of the international career I have yeah. done. And I have really not uh, so much time to... to The Marshalline, for example, was the first time I sang the Marshalline. Was it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I have not uh, too much time to prepare there. Mm -hmm. And I came to Blindborn with very, very bad uh, mining of myself. <laughs> anyway, I came and to the first rehearsal, I remember I'm sitting down there very afraid. I don't tell anybody. And Maestro Pritchard, John Pritchard was there. And after the second or the third bar I sang, he stopped it. And he says, I like to speak with you alone. Mm -hmm. So we go in one little place. And he says, you not know the part, <laughs> madame. <laughs> <laughs> and I says, no, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I have yeah. too much to learn that mm -hmm. I have come mm -hmm. here and I not know the part. Mm -hmm. And that was on the 22 of April. And the premiere was 16 of Ma mm -hmm. uh, May. And uh, I say, uh, I'm sorry, so you have to replace you to take another thing. Oh, good. I say, no, 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 no. I learned. Mm -hmm. I learned that part. But this is impossible. How you can learn the marshalling? You know, that's a role. <laughs> that you say, well, you never understand what that for a role is, he says. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, and that's normal. That's true. That's the truth. I know say it's not. <laughs> but I was very. Uh, I say, I have a contract, and I want to do, please, let me try for an, one week. And after one week, you decide it, if you accepted me or not. And in between, you look for another singer. Oop, when I'm not prepared, the other singer uh, do that role. So that was, and uh, we rehearse. And I was rehearsing. I was not sleeping all that week. Uh -huh. I promise to you, I, I was not sleeping. I was day and night, learning and learning and learning, <laughs> so that finally I closed my eyes. I only see knots. <laughs> was terrible. And I have the recordings, I remember, in a little house. We have uh, take it in Glyndebourne, and I play all the time, all the time, all the time, <laughs> you see, by eating everything. So after one week, we, re we rehearse again, was not uh, Parker, not a memoir, no. But many things, yes. But everything was okay. So, my uh, 
preacher says to me, uh, you see, I, I never have thinking you can do it. But today I have to say you do it. Then came the problems with my size, you see, <laughs> and the, all the dresses. And marshalling is a, a nice role, but you need to be not so big, mm -hmm. it's better. <laughs> and to have a good deshabillé and everything. So for me it was a little embarrassing, you know. <laughs> So I done the marshalling and uh, the, the people of Glenville was a little upset while they was not uh, a bit uh, a bit it. Accustomed to. Uh, they had not the habitude that the singers come without no, the part. Yes, quite <laughs> And uh, he was a little mad with me. And I said, I am so sorry. I am so disappointed. And I try my best, everything what I can. But in the moment, it was for me impossible to learn more quickly. And and he, th the people has think it that what I learned that part in 20 days was not good enough. And for me, it was very pleasant to read all the reviews after. So that was for me A happy ending. very happy ending. Yeah. Anyway, not anything was terrible in Glyndebourne. Why, uh, Mariage of Figaro was very nice, and uh, we done with a great success when we do it the performance. At the beginning of Act Three of Mozart's Marriage of Figaro, the Countess is lamenting the loss of her husband's affections and recalling the days when their love was mutual and complete.
you, you talk very freely and very unselfconsciously about your size. And this I find, <laughs> well, if I may say so, it's charming. Not a secret. <laughs> and very, well, it's not a secret, but it's very rare that a singer can talk about it as, as freely and with humour like you. Yes. Have you found it a problem, some of the parts, after all, that, uh, that you sing or that you have to sing or that you might want to sing? Well, the big problem is Salome, you see. Ah. <laughs> I, you recorded Salome. I recorded But you've but never sang it on stage? Oh, yeah, many oh, times. Yeah. Before I was like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I sang in Wien, I, in the Staatsopera. Yeah. I sang in Dusseldorf. I sang in Bremen too, and in Basel. The first time was in Basel, and in Brussels. So in many places. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a role that I like it very much. Mm. Anyway, in my actual position, <laughs> it is difficult to play in stage. Well, that uh, will be like a humoristic Salome. <laughs> but I hope with the years, perhaps I will be a little smaller. You I can believe, do it again. You don't believe in, so to speak, matching the size to the part by, say, losing some of uh, your weight? Well, I am afraid, you see. I mean, I was very small before, mm -hmm. as you know, and then I, I was ill, and I have to make a two years long cure, mm -hmm. and I was after like that. And the doctor says, not worry about, it's only provisory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> after you are good, you can be the same again, <laughs> but that was not. <laughs> and I am afraid, well, you see, I am, I know, think uh, can be good for the boys no. to lose it's 20 or 30 pounds, yeah. can be dangerous. Yeah. I am sure I tried that when my boys begin to be <laughs> under the cliff. <laughs> we like you the way you are, I'm sure you. Uh, I want you to tell us now about the famous night in New York when oh. uh, your sensational debut. Yes. Um, um, which was an accident, I gather. You mm. stepped in at the last minute. Yes, that was. Uh, I knew it 16 days before mm -hmm. the performance, and uh, that was while Madame Marilyn Horn oh. was uh, expecting a baby. So I do to the baby of Marilyn Horn mm -hmm. my triumph. <laughs> and then uh, I received that offer. I not knew the part either, <laughs> <laughs> only the aria. Uh, I take a look, and I was thinking, my God, that looks difficult. That's really difficult, Lucrezia Borgia, you know, vocal. And I asked uh, Maestro Carlo Felice Cillario, who was in that moment in Barcelona, to working, and I said, Maestro, excuse me, what do you think of that? So I accept it or not, I am so afraid, and it's so difficult part. I want to do, I want, I want. So he says, when you want, you do it. Mm -hmm. Everything you want, it's right. So I say, thank you, that's what I want to hear it. <laughs> and I'm beginning to, to learn. And when I came to New York, I knew the part. It was one week before the performance, so I learned the part in 10 days. Oh, that's <laughs> that's a record. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not so difficult. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, then I was there. And there is uh, an anecdote. You see, well, uh, sure, I sang well. I sang, I sang not bad that night, but I was very nervous. And it's one thing that's made a great impression to that publicum to the press, that was my entrance. And that I have to say, well, it's so comic that not anybody can imagine. You see, and, and Carnegie Hall was like a um, tepish. A carpet. You see, and what I was backstage was not tepish. So the tepish begins there, and I have to go like that. I remember in my entrance when I came, my... Your, your heel? Yeah, yes, you catch it. was there, <laughs> <laughs> you see, the and I... Uh, mm, you fell? Or you stumbled? Mm, well, I, I made an entrance yeah. very <laughs> effective, you see, very comic, and that was, was so impressive for the people, while everyone thinking, I made extra, <laughs> that entrance, and there was an accident. So when I read it in the paper, 
the effective entrance with so much power, I was, I have to left. But anyway, it was, <laughs> was good. And I was very happy. It was a big night. And I want. I play and I want. Has Lucrezia become one of your favorite parts? So beautiful. So beautiful. In Donizetti's Lucrezia Borgia, Lucrezia is understood to have had a son by a former marriage, though nobody else now knows about this, not even the boy himself. In this prologue, Lucrezia sees him asleep and reflects with joy and love on his beauty and nobility. But she also realizes bitterly that she dare not wake him and dare not tell him that she is his mother. For if she did, she fears that he would despise her so she must go on carrying her secret.
Nowadays, you seem to sing mainly the big, beautiful bel canto roles. Well, we have not to forget bel canto means pure song, you know? And bel canto means, means that the sound has to be clean, has to be not broken, has to be egal. Smooth. And for all is expression, expression in the line. And uh, to do it, what the composers uh, has done to sing that, that's the difficult thing. Uh, when you want to sing well, everything is difficult. And I think the bel canto, it's a repertoire that was uh, not dead, but was very much down, yes. put down. And we have the big chance, the big, big chance in our time to have that marvelous singer, that's Maria Callas, and to open all that doors to everyone. And I think all the singers have to be thankful to her to show us the way to make an interesting thing for the lyric and to give the chance to make a renové, renové, with old operas, but yes. anyway, yes, yes. a renové of the lyric with all that bel canto past uh, are really so beautifully, some of, most of them. Would you say that Maria Callas, or any other singer for that matter, has influenced your style, your singing, your work in any way? I don't think so, but anyway, uh, I think that the colors uh, do it for anybody of us that came after uh, a way, a way to, to do something interesting for the lyrica. Any way to make an imitation or the try to oh. try to sembler something like yes. colors, it's impossible okay. while yes. colors is only one. One of the great bel canto roles that sooner or later every soprano must sing is Norma. But you left Norma surprisingly late in your career. You'd sung many other roles first. Why was that? You wonder as I am honest? Yes, please. I left Norma while I was think I can be never a Norma. Well, you need so many things to be a good Norma. Today is not one. Everyone tried to sing Norma. I have tried to, and I sang. I have a repertoire, like other singers. It's a role that made great satisfaction. And uh, it's a lovely part to sing and to play. But I know I am not a Norma. I am the doctor. <laughs> anyway. I think, uh, why leave Norma when it's not another one better? I can't sing. And that's the reason I sang. I have waited so many years while it's an opera that needs a great preparation. And what is a role that needs, um, that you are very, no, that's not the word. That you are very, very uh, uh, strong in your mind. That's what I mean, to do it. And you know exactly what you want, which way you want to done. And that's the reason I leave it. I was sung when I was thinking, I am prepared to sing Norma. That not means I am a good Norma, but I cannot do better. And when I wait three or four years more, perhaps I cannot sing more Norma. So that was the reason, I think. Now it's the time. Just as Bellini's Norma is one of the greatest of all operatic roles, so this huge and famous aria from it, Casta Diva, is in itself one of the chief summits of Italian bel canto singing. Norma is set in ancient Gaul, which is occupied by the Romans. The heroine is the high priestess of the Druids, but she has secretly broken her vows and borne two children to her lover, the Roman proconsul Polione. 
In this aria, she first performs the sacred rite of cutting the mistletoe and invoking the moon. Casta Diva means chaste goddess. The people urge her to declare that the time is ripe for them to rise against the Romans. But Norma fears for Polione's life and seeks to restrain them while promising that she will soon give the signal for the oppressors to be destroyed.
There are very few singers indeed like you, but there are many opera houses. That means that you are constantly in demand from all over the world. You must lead a life that uh, in other ages would have been called slavery. I, you, you mentioned to me that for four years ahead you know your engagements. I see. Do you find this difficult to, to, to think that you know four years? I mean, how many people or how many of us know what we're going to be doing four years from now? But you do. Do you find this difficult? Well, I know remember. That's <laughs> it. I don't remember exactly everything. No. I remember most of them, but not everything. I find it a little strange, I yeah. have to say. It's why you see, you never know what happens next moment. Mm. And to think in that time I will be there, or I will be da, or I will be seeing da, it's made me a strange impression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I prefer not think yeah. of all that, while it's, uh, it's a real strange, strange impression. <laughs> you must obviously spend a great deal of time traveling, as all singers, all musicians must do. How long do you ever get to spend in any one place? No, not very long. Uh, most of them one month. Yeah. One month for a new production, let's say, four or five performances. One month, but uh, most of the time it is 10 days there, 15 days yeah. there, or the shorter time. Sometimes only one week. And how long do you get to spend in, an, in any one year at your home? Where is your home now? Where do you regard as your home? <laughs> My home is in Barcelona, yeah. in Spain. And I am there one month for December and a few days in the summertime. Mm. So I think one and a half months in all. <laughs> this, is, this is the only time you have to spend normally with your family, among your family then? Or do yes. they travel with no. you? Well, yes, yes, yes. I have a little song, oh, three yes. and a half, you see, and I missed him so much. Yeah. And I want to have him so often as possible with me. So when we are in Europe, we take it uh, with us. For example, when last February and March, we are in the Scala, so he was with us in Milano. And now in May, he was with us in Rome. And uh, now perhaps he will come next September with us to America. While well, we are from September until 12th of December in between New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, etc. And that's a long, long time to not see the poor child. I, I mean, he calls me always on the telephone and says, Mommy, when you come yeah. again? Why are you singing too much? You have sung enough. <laughs> <laughs> How big is your repertoire? Can you even count the number of roles? Uh, 82 operas. 82? All play and stage. Really? Really. <laughs> Just as Glyndebourne has a reputation for discovering great singers early in their career, so Covent Garden has perhaps something of a reputation for engaging them rather later than those of us who would like to hear them could wish. <laughs> How is it that you have not yet sang at Covent Garden? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> my Covent Garden debut will be in the 72. I think it's June 72 with La Traviata. Ah. But uh, Covent Garden had asked me many times to sing. Oh, good, good. Only was not possible while I, the dates were really busy. Yes. 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 <laughs> Traviata, did you, choo did you choose Traviata for your debut or were you asked to sing in well, the Well, I give there? some different operas oh, yes. and in that opera was Traviata. Well, it's a role that I really sang very much mm -hmm. and I like it very much to sing. As a listener only, I feel, and a lot of people feel, that the Verdi heroines demand something more than the, than the Rossini and the Donizetti. Yeah, Do you find true. that too? Mm -hmm. Demand more voice. <laughs> and psychologically also more? Yes. Well, uh, and the, um, the, the roles, they are almost the same. Only the orchestra is much more big. Oh. So you need more volume for m most of the roles of Verdi. That's the reason I'm seeing very little Verdi's. I'm we seeing uh, Otello, Traviata, and uh, Ballo in Maschera, uh, Trovatore, and Luisa Miller, and all that kind of more lyric roles of Verdi. Don Carlo. Do you have a favorite among them? Yes. I like Trovatore very much, it's beautiful, 
for all the uh, the area of uh, the Morsula Le Rose. It's a beautiful thing. Well, it's very much Belcanto inside and demands a great uh, kind of expression, of musical expression. Il Trovatore has one of the most complicated plots in all opera, but this scene, the Miserere scene, is comparatively simple. Manrico the troubadour, that is what Trovatore means, has been captured by his enemy, the Count di Luna, and condemned to death. It is the night before his execution, and outside the tower in which he is imprisoned, Leonora, the heroine, has come to take her last farewell of her lover. Their duet must be the only love duet in all opera in which the two singers do not actually meet, and its poignancy is increased by the chorus of monks who are chanting the Miserere, the prayer to God for mercy on the dying.
Cosa 